Everybody talk loud there and see what happens. Good morning, Dan. Good morning, Dan. Would you like for me to sing for you this morning? Oh, that's good. That's really good. Okay. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for He is good. Okay. Glad to see all of y'all today. We've got a lot of ground to cover. We want to kind of reorient you to uh, what's going on in the class and uh, we're going to go from there. I'm going to ask several of you some questions here as we get started. What does the word Christ mean exactly, Larry Davis? The word Christ. The word Christ mean um, it's uh, the Greek for the Hebrew word um, Messiah, which means King. Uh, wrong. That's not what the word exactly means. Now you're getting down to what the import of the term is, but what does the word Christ or Messiah actually mean, literally? Anointed. That's uh, correct. Was that Larry, or did he sound different? The other Larry. The other Larry. The other Larry. Okay. Well, that's what it means. Anointed. All right. Let me ask you this, uh, Brother Sean. To what individuals in the Book of First Samuel was this term specifically applied? The term Messiah or Christ. To what individual? To what individuals? <clears throat> Gordy. Uh, to Saul and to David? You are correct, sir. That is exactly right. All right. Uh, if I wanted to go to an Old Testament passage that really uh, captures the historical background and meaning of the term Christ or Messiah, what Old Testament passage would I go to? Brandon. Psalms 110, verse 4? Um, no. Okay. But you're in the same class, but in the wrong topic there. We're just looking at the term Christ. Jack? Psalm 2, 2. You are a good man, Jack. You are a sharp little cookie. You rock, Jack. Thank you. All right. In what biblical passage, Brother Brett, could I find the Old Testament background of the term Son of Man? Son of Man. Uh, Old Testament passage? Yes. Um, <coughs> how about Daniel 7, 12 through 14? You rock. That's really good. That's where Jesus got his concept of the Son of Man. What other book, Brother Gordy, uses the term frequently, but in a very benign sense that just means a man? Ezekiel. Yes. Good job. Okay. Now, let's talk to me about the term Son of God, Brother uh, Larry Davis, in the Old Testament. Uh, I don't know, Dan. I'm not sure. That's too bad. Raise your hand if you think you do know. Brett? Maybe Psalm 2, 7? Yes, Psalm 2 is the key text for both the term Christ and the term Son of God. Because as Brother Wilkie so saliently pointed out to us a moment ago, the Lord's anointed is the one that's under discussion in Psalm 2, about 2 or so. And a little bit later, God says to his anointed on the day that he makes him king, you are my what, Larry Davis? My son. My son. Today I have begotten you. What would you say is the significance of that word today 
in Psalm 2, verse 7. Brandon Morgan, Brandon Watson. <laughs> um, when he was anointed, that it, he became his son. Okay, and that meant he became what? Sorry, what? And that meant that God made him what? Um, preeminent ruler. King. That's right. So eventually, both the word Christ and the word Son of God to a Jew meant basically what? That this person was what? King. King. God's chosen king. That's exactly right. All right. Um... There's a bunch of other stuff we're going to talk about, but that will work for us for a little while. Let's go back to the screen here. We talked at length the last time we were together about Jesus as the high priest. What New Testament book primarily is our source for this uh, idea of Jesus as the high priest, Brother DeRay? DeRay? Uh, Hebrews chapter 6. Well, Hebrews in chapter 6 is part of it. Okay. Uh, remember that the high priest was the one that uh, did the work of atonement and intercession at the Ark of the Covenant, which was the mercy seat or the throne of grace. And the only way we can draw near to the throne of grace is through Jesus, our priest. And we talked about how this particular scripture, Psalm 110, verses 1 through 4, figures into the structure of the book of Hebrews. About three chapters of the book of Hebrews are a discussion of this passage, Psalm 110, verses 1 through 4. And verse 4 is, of course, the verse that says, The Lord has sworn and will not repent. You are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. And just to review a little bit, you remember that that psalm, which is quoted frequently in the New Testament, in different passages, says the Lord, namely Yahweh, says to my Lord, Edonai, you, that is Edonai, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies the footstool for your feet. See, the one being addressed is David's Lord. <coughs> it turns out to be the Christ. He's, he's David's Lord. And uh, come on in, guys. Find a spot. But... Uh, this is what we were talking about last time about Christ being the high priest. We analyzed that passage and, and took the yous and the yours uh, down a little further. And then when you get to verse 4, the Lord, which is again Yahweh, has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. Now, throughout the book of Hebrews in that chapter uh, 5 through 7, the Hebrew writer is discussing this Old Testament uh, passage. And he talks about in Hebrews chapter 6 that Brother Sean mentioned a minute ago that there are two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. If you go back in that same passage, Hebrews chapter 6, one of those is the oath that he swore to Abraham when he gave Abraham the great promise of God that in him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And the other was his oath in Psalm 110, verse 4. You see where it says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. So Hebrews 6.18 is talking about those two oaths, the oath to Abraham and the oath to uh, David, you know, to, to, the, to the David's Lord in Psalm 110.4. It says that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, you might have a strong encouragement to have fled to take hold of the hope that is set before you. So those two unchangeable things are the Lord's oaths, and it was the Lord's oaths that caused uh, this new priesthood, the priesthood of Jesus after the order of Melchizedek. So in that section in Hebrews chapter 6 and 7, all the way up into the first part of chapter 8, the Hebrew writer works on several words from Psalm 110, verse 4. He keeps going back to the word oath or sworn. And he keeps picking at that word sworn or oath and how it was the oath of God that made Jesus a priest. 
And then he, he keeps going to the word priest uh, out of this. He says, you are a priest forever. And he keeps bringing up the fact that Jesus is the priest. And then he works over that word forever. And he says he's able to save to the uttermost, that he ever lives, and he always lives. And he, he, he talks about eternal redemption, and all of those words come off of this word forever in Psalm 110, verse 4. So he keeps hammering on the word uh, forever. And then, of course, he also works on the word Melchizedek, and all of those words are the words that he keeps drawing out of this uh, passage, Psalm 110, verse 4. And uh, so he does that for two chapters at least. And then, if you look at Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1, this is the transition chapter where he transitions from discussing uh, Psalm 110, verses 1 through 4 to discussing Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. But notice Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 and how he brings this together. Uh, read there, if you will, for me, Brother uh, Larry Davis, please, sir. Verse 1. Yes, sir. Now, the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. All right, now stop right there. See, he's been discussing Psalm 110, 1 through 4. And he says, now, the main point of what we are discussing is this. We have such a high priest. How do we know we have him? Psalm 104, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. But notice the wording here in verse uh, 1. Who has sat down on the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high. Now where does that business about sitting down on the right hand come from? Hebrews 1, 1, 3. Well, yeah, yeah, but where does it come from before that? Earth to everybody. Come in, please. My right hand. So I make your enemies my footstool. Yes, Brother Gordy. Where is that? Psalm 110. Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies the footstool of thy feet. See? And verse 4 of Psalm 110 is where the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. So if you go back all the way, as Larry pointed us out, to Hebrews 1, verse 3. Go back to Hebrews 1, verse 3. See there he says at the end of verse 3, When he had made purification for sins. Now who could do that? The high priest. The high priest. He's already coming out of Psalm 110. See? He sat down on the right hand. That's Psalm 110, verse 1. Of the majesty on high. See? And he works this and works it and reworks it. And finally he gets down to Hebrews 8 and says, Now the point of what we've been saying is this. That we do have such a high priest. He started this at Hebrews 4.15 and been working it ever since. We do have such a high priest uh, who sat down on the right hand of God, see, <clears throat> Jesus. And he starts talking about this high priest. Now, go down to... Uh, Verse, uh, uh, start with verse 4 and read down through verse 6, if you would, Brother Larry Davis again, please, sir. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle. For see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. All right, now look carefully at verse 6. And if you have your Greek text, open it up there at verse 6. Look at verse 6 real carefully. Verse 6 is the transition verse between discussing uh, Psalm 110, verse 1 through 4, and Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. And here are the two transition words that put those two passages together. You have the word ministry, ministry, and that is the word leiturgias, leiturgias. Now, it's not diakonos or diakonia, it's leiturgos. Leiturgos means a priestly ministry, see? It's the ministry of a priest. So, 
So what he says is, he has uh, gotten a more excellent ministry. He's obtained this ministry. See, that's the conclusion of the discussion of Psalm 110, verse 1 through 4, that says, God has made Jesus a high priest forever. So we can now conclude that he has obtained this priestly ministry. But we're going we're gonna to see that you can't have a new priesthood unless you have a different covenant, a different agreement. And so the word covenant is the transition word to Jeremiah 31 because in Jeremiah 31 he says, Behold, the days come that I will make a new covenant. See? So he transitions in that verse, verse 6, from talking about Psalm 110, verses 1 through 4, to talking about Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. And for the next two chapters, he discusses the hound out of Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, just like he did in the previous chapters, discussed Psalm 110, verses 1 through 4. So the point here for us, as far as Christology is concerned, or the titles of Christ is, that Jesus Christ is a high priest according to the eternal uh, order of Melchizedek. All right? <clears throat> so, uh, anyway, this is the transition verse right here that we were talking about. The ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs, that is the uh, Levitical ministry, uh, as the covenant that transitions you to Jeremiah is superior, of which is a mediator, is superior to the old one, and it is found on better promises. Okay? So, ministry and covenant. Now, let me ask you a couple other questions uh, from our class last time. Uh, Brother Jack, what is the meaning of the word Melchizedek? Go, Jack. Uh, righteous king. King of righteousness. Melech, king. Zedek, righteousness. Melchizedek, king of righteousness. Now, Melchizedek was also the king of an ancient city. What city? Jerusalem. Okay, remember the Hebrew word for city is I-R, ear. And the city of which he was the king was Salem. So the city of Salem is Ir Salem, which later was pronounced out. Jerusalem. See? So he was the king of righteousness, his name meant, but he was also literally the king of Ir Salem, the city of Salem, city of peace. And so some of these uh, allegorical type things are applied to Jesus in the book of Hebrews as well. How do we know... Uh, Melchizedek was greater than Abraham. What did he do? When, yeah, Brother Gordy. Uh, Abraham paid tithes to him. All right. And what else? That's exactly right. What passage, by the way? Genesis 14, 17. Yes, sir. Genesis 14. And uh, if uh, what else does it say about uh, Melchizedek there that shows he's greater than Abraham, Brandon? I'd have to look. Anybody? Well, he was a priest of God Most High, but what did he do toward Abraham? He offered a uh, sacrifice for him. No. Y'all are, are smoking crack now. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> he blessed Abraham. See? He blessed Abraham. Not the other way around. And... Abraham paid tithes to him. And all of this is showing the superiority of the uh, Melchizedekian priesthood over, over the other priesthood. Because Levi was still in his great granddaddy's loins when uh, Melchizedek was uh, blessing Abraham and Abraham was paying tithes to Melchizedek. Okay. All right. Anybody want to ask any questions about the high priesthood thing? Brother Gordy. Uh, when we said a minute ago that uh, today I have begotten you. Yeah, that, that, Psalm 2. Yep, that didn't, um, 
that did and he was made king at that point that didn't take place till the resurrection of Christ we said right uh, look at Romans 1 verse 4 Romans 1 verse 4 and Romans 1 4 Paul seems to be referring back to Psalm 2 read Romans 1 4 for us there brother Ro read it out where we can hear you please sir to do through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God by His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Alright, and actually, the, if you look at the Greek text there, it's the word ek, and it means from the point of the resurrection of the dead. So when Jesus was raised from the dead, He was declared to be the Son of God. Well, that goes back to Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, where I will tell of the decree, this is the king talking, the Lord said to me, to the king, You are my son, today I have begotten you. See? The today is the day that God made him king. See? And God pronounced him to be his son, the day God made him king. Now he was anointed as king when, Brandon? John? Baptism. At his baptism, Acts 10, 38, he was anointed by the Holy Spirit and power, but he was installed as king at his resurrection. Just like David was anointed by Samuel, and then much later he was installed as king. See? But that's the same thing that happened to Jesus. He was anointed and then installed. So the today means the day I make you king. So most of the time in Jewish thinking, the term son of God did not mean born of a virgin. What it meant was to most Jews that you are God's chosen what? King. King. That's right. As in Psalm 2. You are my son. Nathaniel said it in John 1.49. You are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. So he understood the Jewish sense of son of God. Okay, not that Jesus wasn't born of a virgin, he certainly was, but that's not the typical meaning of the, of the Christological term Son of God as it refers to Jesus. Okay, Brother Harold, do you want to weigh in here anywhere? I'm quite interested. I'm enjoying it. All right, very good. We're glad to have Dr. Harold Red in here today. and uh, you get, Let me know when you have to leave because I want you to talk to him for five minutes. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, uh, next title we want to look at briefly here, Christological title, is Hodas, the way, the way. First John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the Hodas, but the Hodas means the road or the path, the way, the road, the path. And uh, this is interesting for, for several different reasons. Jesus called himself the way. But there is a theological history in the Bible of talking about the road or the path as it deals with walking with God or not walking with God. Uh, Psalm 1 is one of the key passages here where, you remember, the psalmist says, Blessed is the man that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly or stand in the way of sinners, etc. And at the end of that psalm, after he's discussed the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked, he says, For the Lord watches over the way, the path of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So some people call this the metaphor of the two ways. There's the way of the righteous and there's the way of the wicked. There's the path of God and the path that's not the path of God. Uh, another passage where this way metaphor is used, Matthew 7, 13 and 14. You know, enter through the narrow gate, the gate is wide, and the way, the path, the road is broad that leads to destruction. For the gate is small, and the way, the path, is narrow that leads to life. So again, just like Psalm 1, you have the way, the walking of the way. And there are other passages in the Old Testament where you have the metaphor of walking the path. And usually these are dichotomous, meaning there's one or the other. There's not like 15 different paths. There's either the way, the way of the wicked. There's either the broad way or, or the narrow way. And uh, 
this becomes even more interesting since Jesus called himself the way because Christianity itself came to be known as the way somewhat in the, in the New Testament era. Uh, Simon <coughs> is uh, trying to find uh, Christians at Damascus and it says in Acts uh, 9 verse 2, he asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found it belonging to the way, now you could take that different ways, couldn't you? Because, see, Jesus said, I am the way. So that could be another way of saying belonging to Christ. But it could also be talking about the fact that Christ taught a particular way of life, a particular path, a particular road of moral and ethical and religious teachings that led to the Father. You know, uh, was it Thomas that said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? The road, the path. We've got to know the road. Which road is it? He said, I'm the road. And yet even in John's gospel, he talked about following Jesus and he would walk the right way. And uh, so there, there's, uh, there are two things going on there. Jesus himself is the path. And as you follow Jesus, you walk the path, the way, the road. Uh, look up these two passages here. Um, let's see here. Uh, Calvin, how about looking up uh, 24, 14, and 22? And uh, Antoine, how about getting uh, Acts 22, 4 there, if you would, please, sir. Acts 22, 4. Let's go to 22, 4 first. Acts 22, 4. Read it out where we can hear you. I persecuted this way to the death. And putting both men into All right, I persecuted this way. See, again, Christianity is referred to as this way, this path. 22, uh, excuse me, 24, 14, and 22, uh, Calvin. 14. But this I confess to you, that according to the way, which they call the sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, all right, now that's interesting because according to the way which they call a sect. So Christianity is being referred to clearly there as the way. Read verse 22 there, Calvin. But when Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceedings and said, when Messiah, the commander. That's good enough. So he, he had more accurate knowledge of the way because he had been told about Christianity. Uh, interesting to me is the fact that today we're losing the whole idea that there is a particular marked out path that is Christianity. It's not just some generic, you can't feel it, you can't get on it type thing. There is a particular path that has particular information that directs you along this path and is following Jesus and that's the way but this Christological title I think is significant because it goes along with metaphors that are all in the New Testament for example you talk about in Ephesians uh, chapter 4 or chapter 5 verse 1 uh, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love well, that's the way, the path of love, as opposed to the path of hate. Uh, Ephesians 4.17, This I say and testify in the Lord that you no longer walk as the Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Well, that's the path of the Gentiles, the way of the Gentiles, versus the way of Christ. Uh, 1 John 1, uh, what, 5 through end of there, you know, if we walk in the darkness or if we walk in the light. First uh, John 2, verse, what is it, 6? He that says, I know him, ought to walk even as he walked. So there's the way of Christ. Uh, Romans 8, walk not according to the flesh, but what? According to the Spirit. So you've got the New Testament filled with walking the way metaphors. And they're all dichotomous. Meaning, you either got this way or that way. You don't have 15 choices. You're either on this path or that path. And uh, that metaphor seems to go back to this, this idea 
of, uh, excuse me, of the way. So this is an important title, uh, The Way, and I want you to remember it. So we've talked about the high priest that comes out of the book of Hebrews and what Old Testament passage? Jack. I don't know. Yes, you do. You just didn't, weren't listening to the question. The high priest title comes out of the book of Hebrews and what Old Testament passage? There's Genesis 17, but... No, no. John DeRay. Psalm 110, 1 through 4. Correct, the Mundo. And then the Hodas, the Way passage, comes from where, Brother Rowe? Psalm 14, 6, Acts 22. That's right, and all those other places. That's right, John 14. So Jesus is the Way. Jesus is the path. Jesus is the road. Preach to your people that there's not a multiplicity of roads all going to the same place. There's one road. There's one path. And that's the path that leads to the Father's house. Okay. Now let's look at another one that I find very interesting. Jesus is Jacob's ladder. Jacob's ladder. Say now, what am I smoking? Well, let's go back to John 1 and verse 51. John 1, verse 51. Any of y'all go back far enough into the 60s and stuff? Remember the song, Stairway to Heaven? Mm -hmm. Now, some of y'all are lying because I know that's not y'all's kind of music. (laughs) (laughs) That's what Led Zeppelin or something like that, Stairway to Heaven. Well, this is the Stairway to Heaven. Look at John 1, 51. Then he added, I tell you the truth, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Well, the he here that's talking is Nathaniel. And Nathaniel didn't know that anything good could come out of Nazareth. So Jesus comes up to him and says, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. And Nathaniel didn't like that because he didn't know Jesus, didn't think Jesus knew him. And then Jesus said, well, Nathaniel, now I saw you when you were by the fig tree. And Nathaniel was so amazed by what Jesus knew that he said in John 1, 49, you are the Son of God, Rabbi. You are the King of Israel. And then Jesus basically said, you ain't seen nothing yet. You think you're impressed by me now. He said, you're going to see the heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, I don't think he meant that literally he would see this. What I think he means here is that he's going to come to realize that Jesus is Jacob's letter. Now, notice the way this is worded. The angels of God ascending on and descending on the Son of Man. But turn back to Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28. In Genesis 28, you have the uh, account of Jacob fleeing from Esau. And uh, he's exhausted and he lays down at this place. And if you look at verse 12, 28 verse 12, it says here, He, Jacob, had a dream in which he saw a stairway or a ladder resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. Now watch this phrase. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Underline that phrase. The angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And then you've got John 1.51 that says, The angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, who was at the top of the ladder? Well, in Genesis 28, verse 13, there above it stood the Lord. So the Lord God is at the top of the ladder, and sinful Jacob is at the bottom of the ladder. And the thing which connects God and man is the ladder. That's the Son of Man. What is it that connects holy God to sinful man? It's that ladder. Who's that ladder? That's Jesus. That's the only way you can get from God to man and from man to God is on that ladder, the Son of Man. 
Nathaniel, you don't know who I am yet, but you're going to know that I'm Jacob's ladder. I'm the way between heaven and earth. I'm the bridge between God and man. See? So, Jesus is Jacob's ladder. He's a whole lot more things than that, but that's at least one of the things that Jesus is according to the Gospel of John. He's the way between earth and heaven. The bridge between God and man. Okay. Are you feeling it, Brother Larry? Yes. Okay. Let's look at another one. Let's just look at the name Jesus. The name Jesus. Now, technically, I suppose you could say that the name Jesus is not a Christological title. It's a name. And yet it's a name that has special significance because of who it's given to. If you look at Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1, and go down to verse 21. Jesus is the Greek word, Yeshua. And you see there in Hebrew is the Hebrew word, Yeshua. Jesus, same, same, in two different languages. The word Yeshua means salvation. Salvation. Yeshua, Jesus, salvation. That's the meaning, the literal meaning of the Hebrew word translated into Greek. Yeshua. So it says in verse 21 of Matthew 1, She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, Yeshua, because he will save his people from their sins. So you're going to name salvation because he's going to save his people from their sins. So even though it's just a name, there's a reason for giving him the name because he is our salvation. He's the one that saves us from our sins. But I want you to know that this name, Jesus, only applied to the man. Now, you can't really say that Jesus lived before the the birth of Christ because the name Jesus was only given to the human being. Before he was Jesus, he was in the beginning was the what? The Word. Now, where can I find about the Word, Calvin? Remember? John 1. And where else, Antoine, can I find about the Word of God? Not this Word of God, but that Word of God. You're killing me, Antoine. (laughs) Okay, Brother Brandon. John 14. Hebrews 4.12. Yes, sir. The Word of God is living. That's not talking about this. That's talking about that one. As living and active and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, quick to discern. That's a person that's doing that. The thoughts and intents of the heart. And then he says, For all things are naked and laid bare before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And in fact, in the end of that verse in Hebrew, it says this logos with whom we have to do. So that's the living Word of God, the Logos. And He was that before He was Yeshua. But He was named Yeshua so that He could be our Savior. Now look over in Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4. And I'm going to ask you about this again a little bit later. Over here in uh, Hebrews 4... Go down to verse 8. Hebrews 4, verse 8. Anybody got a King James there? I got a copy of one. Yes. Somebody read Hebrews 4, 8 and the King James for us. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? All right, now that is what the Greek text says. The Greek text has the word Jesus there. But the NIV says what, somebody? Joshua. It says if Joshua had given them rest, and and it's correct in telling you that, it's really not correct in that the Greek word is there, it's not the Hebrew word, but it understands that the person being talked about is Joshua. 
what the Hebrew writer is saying is, if Yeshua, not the New Testament Yeshua, but the Old Testament Yeshua, had given them rest when they entered into the land of Canaan, then he, David, would not long afterward have said, uh, another day is coming of rest, you know. Uh, today, if you shall hear his voice, harden not your hearts, you know. And that today was talking about a different day that was after the time of Joshua, and that's uh, referring to the time of Jesus. So what I want you to see there is that the word Jesus can refer to the New Testament Jesus or the Old Testament Jesus, and both of them had the same name. So when Jesus' mommy, Miriam, called him every day for supper, I almost guarantee you she didn't use the word Jesus, she used the word Yeshua because she spoke Aramaic or Hebrew. But the New Testament is written in Greek for the benefit of all those people out in the Greek-speaking world. So when Joshua's mommy called him and Jesus' mommy called him, they called him by the same name because they had the same name. Are you with me, Brother Roe, or not? Are you kind of having a hard time with it, or are you with me? <laughs> okay. All right. Anybody want to ask any questions about any of that? So, uh, Yeshua, is it Hebrew, Arabic? I know they're similar. It's Hebrew. Check it out. It's Hebrew. He Hebrew. And it's not Arabic, but Aramaic is the one Aramaic. you're looking for. Aramaic is Syrian. Okay, Brother brother Rowe's got to go, but if before Brother Rowe and Brother Harold go... I want Brother Harold Red, Dr. Harold Red from Memphis. I want him to come up here and give you all about five or ten on some good advice for preachers if they're going to stay in here for the long haul. Come right on up and do it, brother. Appreciate you. Impressive. Yeah. And just look at this camera right back here, and you're talking right to them, see? Well, it's good to be with you today, and it's always good to be with Brother Dan Owen. I'm looking right straight at them, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, and um, I'm impressed with this arrangement for teaching the Bible. Um, if I had to give you some advice for staying and preaching for the long haul, I would say keep doing exactly what you're doing. Study the Bible. Read the Bible. I work with four young men who are planning to preach. They're now graduate assistants doing the MDF program at Harding University Graduate School of Religion. And one of the things that I try to make sure they do a little bit of every day is read and study the Bible. Amen. That's the key to everything. Learn what that book says. And so I'm impressed, uh, Dr. Dan, with what you're doing in teaching the, the depth and the richness of the Word of God. God is over all of this. And he has revealed himself to us in marvelous ways. But I think nothing quite like the Bible. Amen. So I appreciate your work. And I encourage you to keep studying the Bible. God bless you, brother. Glad to have you here. Thanks, Thank you, brother. Thank you. <laughs> see you. Good to see you. All right. When I was uh, a young preacher at uh, Oklahoma Christian, I just started uh, uh, Oklahoma Christian, and I was 19 or something like that, maybe 18. <laughs> Brother Harold's probably about a year older than I am, and uh, there was a bunch of boys that went out on the weekends, and they would preach at uh, youth rallies and other things, and Brother Harold was one of them, and I used to go listen to him preach, and he was about a 19-year-old young man, and he could preach, my goodness could he preach, and I said to myself, man, I want to be able to preach like that one of these days, and uh, he was one of my early inspirations, he kind of took me under his wing, and we became good friends for those years we were in Oklahoma Christian, and then uh, we kind of got away from one another and kind of observed each other's work from afar, but it's good to see fellas like that. Okay. Anybody?
anybody have any other questions on what we've talked about so far? All right, why was he named Yeshua, according to the scripture? Because he will save his people. Because he would save his people. And Yeshua means what? Not salvation. Salvation. That is correct. Okay. Well, let's take a little short uh, pause right there. And we'll come back in just a minute. Everybody talk loud. Uh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Have, now, hey, Dan, have you, have you heard the uh, slowed down version of that? No. It is hilarious. I've <laughs> never heard someone sound more high or drunk in my life. It is really funny. You'll have to I'm, hear it. I'm sure you've enjoyed, enjoyed it immensely. All right. Now let's go <laughs> over to Acts chapter 2, verse 36. What I want to talk to you about briefly here for a few minutes is kind of tying in about three <coughs> Christological titles together. Because the confession of Christ, what we call the good confession in the first century, took three or four different forms. It wasn't consistent in one form all the time. But... It was based on two or three Christological titles that had the same meaning, basically, and it was some of the some of the central point of early gospel preaching. At the end of the Pentecost sermon in uh, Acts chapter two, um, Peter was concluding that sermon about Jesus, and he said, "Let all the Israel house of Israel know for sure that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ." And, of course, we've talked about uh, especially the Christ, the anointed, the title there. But if you look at Acts chapter 2, and if you go back up earlier to verse 21, Peter quoted this passage from Joel, and he was telling them that the outpouring of the Spirit was evidence that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, underlined the Lord, will be saved. But see, what he's trying to prove in the rest of the sermon is that Jesus is Lord upon whom we must call to be saved. And the word call upon means to trust in, to appeal to somebody for help, to, to know that we can't do it without their help, you see. So everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And then, if you go down to verse 34... He quotes another verse. David did not ascend to the heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, and again, my Lord refers to Jesus. See? Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies the footstool of your feet. Well, that's Psalm 110.1, you know. And then he says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Well, of course, the word Christ means the anointed basically had the, had the um, import to first century Jew of this was God's anointed king. Lord, kurios, means ruler or master. So he's master, ruler, and king, see? But he is the Lord of Joel 2.28 and the Christ of the Old Testament passages. And salvation depends on him. So Lord and Christ were key concepts in New Testament gospel. That Jesus is Lord. That Jesus is the Christ. There were various uh, passages in the New Testament where confessions of Jesus were made. Some of these were uh, pre-baptismal confessions and some were not pre-baptismal confessions. <coughs> but let me give you a couple of examples of, of some of these. Look at uh, Romans 10, verse 9. Romans 10, verse 9. Paul is referring 
in that passage to the fact that we can't make ourselves righteous, but we have to depend on Jesus to make us righteous through his death on the cross. And he's saying in the passage itself that we don't have to do the work of salvation, that God has done the redemptive work on the cross and in the resurrection for us. We have to trust in that work and take advantage of the work that Jesus had done. And that it's not out of our reach, it's within our reach. He says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So this is probably the a, at least a verbatim quote of the early confession as it was sometimes made. It was as simple as Jesus is Lord, and it was it was the way it said in Greek is Kurios Jesus, Kurios Jesus, Jesus is Lord, and it's actually in the reverse, the Lord is Jesus, but that's the way it was said in the Greek language, Kurios Jesus, Jesus is Lord, and when Caesar would conquer territory for the Romans, people were forced to say Kurios Caesar, Caesar is Lord. See? But in this case, the one who was to become a Christian would say, Kurios uh, Jesus, Jesus is Lord. In other words, he's going to be my ruler, my master from this day forward. So that was the idea of, of uh, Jesus being Lord. If you go back earlier in Romans to Romans 6.16, 6, this gets to the idea from the other end. It says, don't you know that to whomever you present yourselves as slaves to obedience, his slaves you are whom you obey? So if Jesus is the Lord or the Master, then we're the slaves. See, we're the ones that are going to obey our Master. So this is one of the forms in which the good confession uh, was made. Then another um, form of the good confession, which... I'm calling it the Good Confession because it was the pre-baptismal confession that people made before they were baptized into Christ. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 12. You might look that up in your own Bible so you can compare. 1 Timothy 6, 12. And notice the way this is worded. He says, Fight the good fight of the faith, lay hold on life eternal, Whereunto thou wast called, or if you're looking at another version, unto which you were called, and did confess the good confession. So if you straighten this out, you confessed the good confession unto life eternal. It led you to, it's leading toward life eternal. <coughs> this shows that this is a pre baptismal confession that was made by Timothy in the sight of many witnesses. Now, let me explain to you why I'm making a distinction between other confessions and pre-baptismal confession. And uh, some of you are not doing much writing, but you need to be. Uh, there were uh, different settings for confession. One setting for confession of Christ was preaching. Matthew 10, 32 and 33 is talking about confessing Christ while you're preaching. Whoever confesses me before men, him will I confess before my Father in heaven. Whoever denies me before men, him will I deny before my Father in heaven. That's Matthew 10, verses 32 and 33. And the context of that is when the disciples were going out from village to village preaching, Jesus said, there's going to be pressure and persecution on you, and you're going to be tempted not to say anything in my name because you're going to be afraid to speak. But he says, but whosoever confesses me before men, him will I confess. Whoever denies me before men, him will I deny. So he's not talking about a confession before baptism. He's talking about preachers out there in the pagan world who are trying to speak up for Christ and being too afraid to speak up for Christ. And... The, the one who confesses me is the one that goes ahead and preaches Jesus Christ, even if he's afraid to do that. See? So that has nothing to do with baptism. That has nothing to do with the process of salvation. That's talking about preaching. And when you're, when you're courageous or not courageous, to go ahead and speak out in your preaching. 
So if you're going to teach people how to be saved, you don't need to be quoting Matthew 10, 32, and 33, because that's not a passage about that. That's for preachers who are out there and too afraid to preach. You with me? <clears throat> Matthew 10, 32, and 33. <clears throat> Another uh, setting of confession was to separate between truth and heresy. And this was really in a teaching or preaching setting as well, but it was about separating truth and heresy. Look at 1 John 4. <clears throat> 1 John 4. It's talking about trying to separate between true prophets and false prophets. 1 John 4, uh, 1 3, if you would please, Brother Sean, to read. First John four two. First John four one through three. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. All right, this is, <clears throat> so, so that is good enough there, but what he's talking about is to test, to see whether you've got a true teacher of God or a false teacher, you see what they confess. In other words, what is their belief about Jesus, see? And so you're testing their belief, but this has nothing to do with the confession that leads to salvation. <clears throat> So, a confession in, in the context here is a statement of one's belief. In order to separate a true, true prophet or a true teacher from a false prophet or a false teacher. So, confessions were made in the setting of preaching. They were made in the setting of separating between true prophets and false prophets. But there was also the pre-baptismal confession. And the pre-baptismal confession was a statement of conviction and commitment. It was really a statement of, of commitment more than anything else. It's not just a statement of intellectual conviction. It's a statement of commitment. James 2 says the devils believe and tremble. So if you were to ask one of the demons, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, what would he say? He'd say, of course I do. Absolutely. But that's not the same thing as the confession because the confession before baptism is not just a statement of conviction. It's a statement of personal commitment. See? And that's the difference. And if you look over here at 1 Timothy 12, this confession that Timothy, or excuse me, 1 Timothy 6, 12, this confession that Timothy made unto eternal life in the sight of many witnesses was a confession of commitment and Paul is reminding him to keep that commitment. <clears throat> Notice in verse 13 Paul says, I charge thee <clears throat> in the sight of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who before, before Pontius Pilate witnessed the good confession. Well now wait a minute. Jesus and Pilate you know, in John 18, Pilate keeps asking Jesus the same question over and over again. Are you a what? King of the Jews. Are you a king? Are you the king of the Jews? Are you a king then? And Jesus says, yes, I am a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. See? So the confession that Jesus made before Pontius Pilate was that he was king. See? But we've already seen that the word king, or the idea of being king, is the same as what two Christological titles? Son, Son of God and Christ. See? Both of those have the same idea as the king, the one God has chosen to be king. See? So, if you confess that Jesus is your king, what does that mean about you? What are you committing yourself to do? Serving. Serving. To, to obey him, to do what he says, because he's king and you're his subject there, see? 
That's the same thing as saying that he's Lord. That means you're his slave and you're going to do what he says. He's king, he's Lord. So see, Paul reminds Timothy of his confession. And then <coughs> verse 13, I charge you in the sight of God and of, of Christ, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed the good confession, that you keep the commandment. And what he means is, you said, Timothy, that Jesus is king. You said that Jesus is Lord. Now you keep that commitment and you keep doing what Jesus is telling you to do. Don't you give up on that commitment. You said, I'm going to follow Jesus as my king. I'm going to follow him as my Lord. Now you can't, you can't go back on that sacred promise, that oath. You made a promise. You keep it. And so he says, keep the command without spot, without reproach. And until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, now watch verse 15, which in its own times he, Jesus, shall show who is the blessed and only potentate or sovereign. What does that mean? It means ruler, the king of kings and the lord of lords. Verse 15 is the confession that Timothy made. He confessed that Jesus is the only ruler, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Just like Jesus before Pilate said, yes, I am the king. See? And that is what Jesus will prove when he comes again, that Jesus really is the only ruler and king and lord and master of all things. Okay? So that is the good confession. So sometimes people just simply stated, Jesus is lord. It had the same meaning. He's the master. I'm the slave. I'm going to do whatever he says from now on. Sometimes it was more expanded. Jesus is the blessed and only potentate, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. The basic meaning of it still was that he's the king and the ruler and the master, and I'm going to do whatever he says. See, that was the idea. And then sometimes people would say, like 1 John 4.15, and I'm not sure this is a baptismal confession, but I'm sure that sometimes it probably took this form. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God abideth in him and he in God. Just like Nathaniel said, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. So see, we already said that in the Jewish mind, the word Son of God, the title Son of God, comes out of what Old Testament passage, Brother Cordy? Psalm 2. Psalm 2, 7. When the Lord said to his anointed king, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Okay? So the Son of God means king. So Son of God really means the same thing as Christ, which really means the same thing as Lord when it comes down to practical application because all of those mean that God is in charge and you're supposed to do whatever he says. See? That Jesus is in charge. Boils down to Matthew 28, 18. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And if you put yourself under that authority, that's what you promise to do before you're baptized into Christ. You promise to obey Jesus as your master. From this day forward, he's going to give you his grace and mercy, free, without charge, his salvation. But you've got to promise to serve him as master before he extends that grace. All right, now, another passage that there's a textual problem with, and, and it's probably rooted in an ancient tradition, but it's not uh, textually accurate, is Acts chapter 8. And that's one that we oftentimes would go to about the good confession, especially if we're reading the King James Bible. Acts 8, verse 30, uh, 35. Philip opened his mouth and beginning at the same scripture, he preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water and said, See, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? And then the King James says, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But in the more modern versions, you don't have that, do you? 
we've got uh, brackets around the text. And your footnote in your, your footnote says textual or early manuscripts do not contain this verse. Yeah, the, the oldest manuscripts don't have this verse. In other words, if you go far enough back, in fact, guess what? The first Greek manuscript that contains that is manuscript Laudianus from the 6th century. Nothing before the 6th century has that in it. So I can tell you for just about for sure that that's not part of the original book of Acts. But what it does show is there was a strong early tradition that that was a form of the confession, that Jesus is the Son of God. And we have that same confession here on the screen in 415. You know, there's no textual problem there that Jesus is the Son of God. But you see, we know that the Son of God is the same thing as saying that Jesus is the King, which is the form we have it in in 1 Timothy 6.15. And we know that that's the same thing basically as saying that Jesus is Lord or Master, which is the form we have it in in Romans 10 and verse 9. So what was the point? Let's put it this way. What was the basic point of the pre-baptismal confession? It was a pledge of allegiance to Jesus as master and king. That's what it was. It was a promise or a pledge of allegiance to Jesus as master and king. Another thing we learn from this, gentlemen, and you need to hear this, is that there is no set wording for that confession. It was worded in different ways. But the point of all of the wordings was the same. And that is that from this day forward, you commit yourself to submit to Jesus as your master, your lord, your king. From this day forward, you're going to do your best to obey him. That's the import of it. So, let me ask you this. What if somebody said, just think about this, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and there's some other guy over here, and he says, well, I do too, but I don't intend to live it. You see what I'm saying? See, one is just saying, well, yeah, I believe the fact of it. But the other one is saying, I not only believe the fact of it, but I believe I, I'm accepting him as my king, and I intend to obey him from this point forward. Which one is the good confession? Well, the latter and not the former. So as we teach people, we need to be sure that we're teaching them that, that part of, of the prerequisite for salvation is the commitment We'll never earn our salvation. We're never going to do anything that merits our salvation. But to accept the grace of God, we need to commit ourselves to try to obey Jesus as Lord. Without that commitment, you know, we're not in the right ballpark. So before someone was baptized into Christ, that confession in some form or another was verbally conveyed now, as time went by, that confession grew and grew and grew, and it became more and more and more. But in the Bible, it was the basic stuff of, of those three things. So, what three titles of Christ would have all been used in one form or another in that good confession, Larry Davis? Uh, Son of God, Christ, and King. Well, yes, actually, you could make it four. There's another one. Our uh, Lord. Lord, yes. And so what would you do if somebody was taking a confession and uh, they here was a guy getting ready for baptism and, and, uh, and the preacher said to them, Do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Master? And the person said, Yes, sir, I certainly do. Would you accept that as a, as a valid confession, Brother Larry? Yes, I would. Yes, I would too. But see, what a lot of people have done, instead of the biblical confession, they've talked about this 
I'm going to call the Savior into my heart stuff, and they're, they're saying other stuff. I'm going to accept Jesus as my personal Savior or something like that. Accepting Him as a Savior isn't the biblical confession. Because He's nobody's Savior until He's your what? No. Your Lord or Master, your King. See? And so the early confession wasn't, I'm going to take Him as my personal Savior. You can't find a Bible verse anywhere that says that. But it was... Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the King. And I'm going to do what He wants me to do from this day forward to the best of my ability. That was the conviction and the commitment. It's not just conviction. It's commitment. Okay? Because the devils have the conviction, but they don't have the commitment. And in fact, in the book of John, it talks about a bunch of the chief priests who believed in Jesus, but they wouldn't confess it because they're afraid to be thrown out of the synagogue. They believed it in their minds, but they wouldn't commit to follow him, to obey him. And there's a big difference between those two things. Brother Larry, you're there. You're yeah, um, live and kicking. I hope the question off the subject, but it's closely related. Um, back in Acts 2.21, uh, where it talks about calling on the name of the Lord. Yes. Uh, the original word for call... Uh, is that a, the best English word to be translated? Epikaleo. Epikaleo. Call upon. It has the import of trusting in or depending on. And you could translate it whoever trusts in or depends on the name of the Lord. In the Old Testament, that which you called upon was that which you trusted in, that which you depended upon. Look at Acts 22.16. Everybody look up Acts 22. Verse 16, and this shows you how people were actually told to accept the grace of God and call upon the name of the Lord. Acts 22, verse 16, Paul was told, Now arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling upon his name. So in the act of being baptized into Christ, we are trusting in or calling upon the name of Christ. In other words, we're trusting in his death, his redemptive death and his grace uh, in order to receive our salvation. But that's when and how we do it. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. But the basic idea in it, you're not trusting in yourself for salvation. You're trusting in Christ and what Christ has done on the cross for your salvation. And when you're baptized into the death of Christ, you're accepting what God has done for you on the cross. You haven't earned anything. You're just receiving the grace of God as a gift. And you're trusting in Him. You're calling on His name. But see, some people have misinterpreted that calling on the name of the Lord to mean, Jesus, save me. Jesus, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior. That's not, that's not the idea. The idea is you're putting your faith in Christ and what Christ has done instead of putting your faith in yourself by doing what God has asked you to do in order to receive His grace. Okay, well anyway, the good confession. I'm going to come back at you with these different settings for confession and some passages where you can find the good confession in the New Testament. Anybody want to ask anything else there about all that? I want to show you, uh, if I can find it here real quick, I want to show you something interesting about that. Open. Um. Wait a minute. Don't go away.
Let's see if you can see this. Can you see that on the screen? Yeah. <clears throat> All right, is it real fuzzy or can you see it in halfway decent way? It's kind of fuzzy. Okay. This is Codex Laudianus, which is a Greek and Latin manuscript that uh, has uh, Latin on the left-hand side and Greek on the right-hand side of the screen. And if you are looking at the right-hand side, the right-hand column, this is the first manuscript in which the confession of the eunuch actually appears in uh, Acts. And if you start at um, the second line, there's one word on the second line. It's all in capital letters, and that's edu, edu, behold. See it? Second line there on the right-hand column, edu, behold. And then the third line is the word hudor, hudor, water. Are you seeing it or not? Yes. Yeah. And then the fourth line is the little word t, t, which means what? And then the fifth line is koluime, what hinders me, fifth line. And then the sixth line is uh, to be baptized. See the word baptithos? Uh, those they say bapti to be baptized, baptithani, baptithani, to be baptized. And then, <clears throat> notice the way it's worded here. Apende is the next line. He said, next line, auto is to him. And then the next line, hold Philippos, Philip. Philip said to him. And now look at, look at the next line after that. A pistuo, if you believe, next line, ex oles, from your whole, next line, pes cardias, with your whole heart, so they say, see that word by itself, so they say, you shall be saved. So even in the form of the wording there, it's not the same wording as you have in the King James. And uh, then it talks about how he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down into the water. But this is the first form of the eunuch's confession uh, that you have uh, in here. And if I wish I could uh, move this camera to, so I could point it out on the screen, but uh, actually, if you keep reading down... Um, you see the line on the left-hand side that has the line scrawled through it in the middle of the page there? Yeah. The line right under that on the right-hand side says, uh, He answered, and then the next line says, Apen, he said, and then here's what he said. Pistuo, I believe, in the... Son of God. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Actually, I believe in the Christ, the Son of God. That's what it says. So anyway, I thought you might find that interesting. I did. The first time I looked at this and tore it apart in the Greek language, I said, Interesting. Not only is this the first Greek manuscript in which it appears, <clears throat> but as it appears in later manuscripts, they can't quite decide which form it ought to be in, and they change up the wording somewhat until you finally get to the form it's in the King James. But if you're honest with the textual tradition, it wasn't in the original book of Acts anyway. It was a later edition. Now, it doesn't affect what we believe about the confession because the confession is in other passages, namely 1 Timothy 6, verse 12 through 15, Romans 10, verse 9, 1 John 4, 15. Anybody want to ask anything? Uh-huh. 
1 Timothy 6, 12 through 15. Romans 10, 9. And 1 John 4, 15. Hey, Dan. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Uh, you said this codex here had parallel columns of Greek and Hebrew? No, Greek and Latin. See, uh, over, oh, here on yeah. the, over here on the left-hand side is Latin. Okay. I was about to See, say like, like, like uh, look at the, look at the um, third line of... Uh, the Latin side on the left hand. You see where it says aqua? Aqua? Yes, sir. That's the Latin word for water. And then you see the, the next line? It says quid. Yes, sir. That means what? And then prohibite me? What hinders me? See, that's the Latin side. The other side, the right hand side, is the Greek side. Are you with me? Yes, sir. Okay. The bilingual codex. I, it's just real hard to see for me. I can't. Yeah. I just knew it didn't look like Hebrew. No, it doesn't look anything like Hebrew. See, look down. Look down. Uh, this will be instructive for you. See the line where the, the line is going through it? The scratching through the line there in the middle? Yes. Drop down one, two, three, the third line below that. See where it says credo? Yes. Credo means I believe. See, a creed is simply a statement of what you believe. Credo, I believe. And uh, you see where it says in Christo, in Christum. And then filium in the next line. Filium means the son of. And then the next line, dei. Filium Dei, the Son of God. Mm. See what I'm talking about there? Yes, sir. That's kind of cool, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Enough about that. We'll make that one go away. We'll come back to this one. So the Christological titles, specifically the titles of Christ, the Son of God, Lord, and King, those are the ones that came into the Good Confession, which was the pre-baptismal confession in ancient times. Okay. Now look at this one here. This is uh, part of the way that the confession developed in later years. About the third or fourth century, uh, the confession had really expanded beyond the simple confession it was. And they were trying to weed out heretics and do everything before the person was baptized. And they would ask them a whole bunch more stuff. Uh, when the person being baptized goes down into the water, he who baptizes him, putting his hand on him, shall say, Do you believe in God the Father Almighty? And the person being baptized shall say, I believe. And then he shall say, Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was born by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary? And it went on and on and said a whole lot of other things about Jesus Christ. And finally, when all that stuff was taken care of, the person would say, I believe. And again he shall say, do you believe in the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Church, in the blah, 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 blah. And then he'd say all that stuff. And then the person would say, yeah, I do. I believe, you know. But it started out real, real simple in the first century. And the simple was, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is my King. Jesus is the Son of God. I promise I'm going to follow him as my Lord, my Master, my King. From this day forward. And then it expanded over the centuries into something bigger, 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 bigger until it became this huge doctrinal statement 
that you had to agree to before you went butter bean? You with me? Yes, Brother D. Reed. Now, is this, does, did it kind of mirror the whole Nicene Creed declaration? Yes. Yes, as time went by, the, the doctrinal issues that were worked at at the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Chalcedon and all those things were brought into the pre-baptismal confession and you'd have to agree with those right things in order to accept baptism in what became then the early Roman Catholic Church. <coughs> you want to ask anything else, Brother Larry? Nope. Taking it all in. Okay. Very good. So, the pre baptismal confession in the first century, pre baptismal confession was a pledge of allegiance to Jesus as Lord and King. In later centuries, in response to heretical teachings, the pre baptismal confession became more of a doctrinal statement to show orthodox belief. It's certainly a creedal or... See, we, we need to understand our terminology. When I talk about a creedal statement, the Latin word credo simply means what? I believe. So it's a statement of what you believe. See? The, the pre-baptismal confession is a creedal statement, but it's not just a creedal statement. It's a commitment statement. It's a statement of allegiance. Okay? So the, think about this. The Pentecost sermon, the first gospel sermon in Christianity, ends by saying, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for sure that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. See, that's what you've got to commit yourself to before you become a Christian. And so the people on Pentecost ask, well, then, if that's true, what shall we do? And he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sin. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But the point, the sticking point was that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is Master. He's King. Okay, we accept that. Now, what do you want us to do? See, that was the import of the confession in the early days. You accept the kingship of Jesus, that he's ruler, master, has the authority over your life, you're going to submit to him. Yes, okay, well, you want, what does he want us to do? Here it is. So that was the way it worked. Okay. Now we're going to talk for a minute about the divinity of Christ. The divinity of Christ. And I want you to know these three scriptures that talk about Christ and his divinity and why they show the divinity of Christ. Of course, John 1.1, 1, 1, you know it. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, and the Word was God. Simple as that. Now, the last God in John 1.1 1, 1 doesn't have the article with it, but it simply means he was divine. He belonged to the category of God. Now, we've talked about the two categories. There's God and there's everything else. Remember those two... Those two factors that are involved in whether you're God or not God, what are they? Creator and worship. Keep All right. You're, you're the creator if you're God, and you're to be worshipped if you're God. And if you're not the creator and you're not to be worshipped, then you're not God. So uh, Jesus is God. Colossians 1.16 clearly says about Jesus, By him were all things created, things in the heavens, things on the earth, Things visible, things invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were made by him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things come together. So this is a, a clear statement of the divinity of Christ as creator. And that before there was anything else, there was Christ. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Then I want you to look at Romans 9, 5. Romans 9, 5.
This is a really good passage on uh, <clears throat> the divinity of Christ. If you go back to verse 3, he said, I, w- I would almost wish myself to be anathema from Christ for my brothers who are kinsmen according to the flesh who are Israelites, uh, whose are the adoption and the glories and the covenants and the giving of the law and the priesthood and the promises of whom are the fathers and of whom is the Christ according to the flesh who is God over all to be praised forever. Now notice verse 5. Of whom is the Christ according to the flesh who is God over all to be praised forever. That just flat out says it just as clearly as it can be said that Christ is God and that he is over all to be worshipped, to be praised forever. So if anybody ever doubts that you should worship Christ, there it is. Why should we worship Christ? Because he's God over all to be praised forever. There's another passage. I didn't write it down here, but I should have. If you look over in the book of Titus, First and Second Timothy, Titus. Go to chapter three. Titus chapter three. Let's see here. Verse 4, he talks about God our Savior. God our Savior. There's another one here in Titus, if I can run it down. Maybe in the first part of Titus. Do what? In verse 6, it says, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Yeah, and it says, God, our Savior, earlier there in verse 3. Um, that's not the one I'm looking for, though. <coughs> it's worded the way it worded is, the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's see here. Uh, it's verse, let's see here. It's Titus 2.13. Titus 2.13. Read 2.13 for me there, Brother Gordy. <clears throat> Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. So there's, uh, there's a number of passages that, that just clearly state uh, the divinity of Christ. And these are some of them. And I want you to at least know this. Now see, some people, if they give you a course in the Godhead, they're just this is the thing they'll center on, is that Christ is divine. Well, Christ is divine. He's God. But there's a whole lot more about Christ, all these titles and their background and their significance that really needs to be explored in Christology other than just the divinity of Christ. But this has been an issue throughout history about whether Christ is divine or not. And these are some passages that that clearly show you that he's divine. Now, going along with that, let's talk for a minute about some Trinitarian statements in the New Testament. Now, preface this, as we have before, with the idea that the word Trinity is nowhere in the New Testament. Uh, The word Trinity is a manufactured word that tries to explain something that cannot be really explained about the threeness of God, even though God is one. And if you look at Matthew 28, 19, this is uh, one Trinitarian statement that's uh, part of... uh, the Great Commission, the teaching on on baptism. And Jesus was telling people to go out and teach and baptize. (coughs) Matthew 28, 
verse 19. Notice he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Now see, that's the commission right there. Make disciples. Uh, later on in Acts, the disciples were called Christians. First in Antioch. So you're going to make a disciple. You're going to make people into Christians. You're going to make them into followers of Christ. Well, how are you going to make disciples? By baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And notice the name... The name, singular, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't repeat the word name. It doesn't say baptize them into the name of the Father and the name of the Son and the name of the Holy Spirit. It says into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And even that is weird. See? But you do have three listed. Of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. And then you have the word teaching. Now notice the word baptizing and the word teaching are participles. The word make disciples is a verb, an imperative verb. So make disciples is the command. And baptizing and teaching are how to carry out the command. See, the two ways you carry out the command. How do you make disciples? You do it by baptizing and teaching. See? And so... Uh, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you. Now, I want you to compare this with Acts 2.38. Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, Brother Larry, some people, when they baptize somebody... They say, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They're coming out of Matthew 28 and verse uh, 19. <clears throat> Other people, they might just say, I now baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And they're coming out of Acts 2 verse 38. Right. Well, which one do you think is right? Well, it's not a... a, a a matter of a statement that we say is a matter of what we're doing and we're baptizing them in Christ. So what's your answer to my question? <clears throat> so Acts 2 3, that would be right also. You're saying that either one of them would be just fine. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Right? And then <clears throat> actually we're not told that this is a verbal formula anywhere. Uh, it is a fact not a formula. In other words, Acts 4, 6 says, by what power or in what name have you done this? In other words, by what authority are you doing this? Well, it's by the authority of Christ. It's by the authority of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In other words, it's by God's authority that we're doing this. It's because they, God has commanded us to do this. Whether you say it or not, you're still doing it in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, or you're doing it in the name of Jesus Christ. But some people think that they have to wave the magic words over the water or it ain't a done deal, you know. And the magic words are not the point. The point is, are you doing this in response to the command of heaven, the command of Jesus, the command of the Godhead? Is that why you're doing this? Is it an obedience to the command of God to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sin. So, it, the wording is neither here nor there. It's just a fact. But uh, this uh, Trinitarian statement, if you can call it this, was connected with baptism uh, in the words of, of Jesus as he gave the Great Commission. And what he's saying is, the authority of heaven is behind, behind this order I'm giving you to go baptize people. Do it because God says so. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit says to go do this. And they say, okay, we will. So, you know, what is said isn't as important as, as what the intention of the person is and what the re uh, response is, is. is It's an obedience to the teaching of the New Testament. Well, look at another one here. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. This is a Trinitarian statement. 
in a little different form. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, in a completely different type of a context. First and second Corinthians, Galatians thirteen. Depending on how your verses are numbered here, it says, May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now this is interesting to me because in twenty eight nineteen here in Matthew, of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. But in Corinthians 13, 14, it says the grace of Christ first, God second, Holy Spirit third. Now, what are you going to do about that? See, because I thought that the, I thought that the Father was like the President of the United States, and then the Son was like the Secretary of State, and then the Holy Spirit was sort of like the Attorney General or something. Well, wait a minute now, but you go to 2 Corinthians 13, you got the Christ on top, and then God, and then the Holy Spirit. Now, hold on now. See what I'm saying? Yeah. So, maybe we ought to think a little bit about that. That's definitely got all three, but it's got them in a different order. But now let's look over here at Revelation chapter 1. John the Revelator. He wrote about the city of God. Let's go over to chapter 1, verse 4 of Revelation. <clears throat> you still with us, Brother Jack? I'm still here. Can you read Revelation 1, verses 4 and 5 for us, please, sir? Yes, sir. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. All and right, now let's this. check. Well, that's good enough. Now let's check this out. Let's look at the ants. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace and peace to you from, number one, the one who is and was and is to come. And, number two, from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And, Number three, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. You got all three there. The seven spirits are the seven branch candelabra, you know, that was in the tabernacle that represented the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's talking about the Holy Spirit. But in this Trinitarian statement, you've got God, Holy Spirit, and Christ. So this one looks like God the Father is the is the top dog, and then the Holy Spirit is really the Secretary of State, and Christ is just the Attorney General. So what do you think about that, Mr. Gordy? Um, I think the order the the order would because the order has changed in these three instances would suggest that they're all three equal. You got that right. It would suggest that there's not really an order, is there? And that God is God. And if you qualify as God, then you're as God as you can get. See? And Father, Son, Holy Spirit are all God and all equal, and they're in different order in different passages. Okay? But these are the three clear statements in the New Testament that are in some form or fashion Trinitarian statements. First, Matthew 28, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Second Corinthians 13, Christ, God, Holy Spirit. Revelation 1, 4, God, Holy Spirit, Christ. And so they're in different order in all three of these things. So who's the general and who's the colonel and <coughs> the majors here? Well, the question is, none of that applies. Because God is God. Does anybody want to ask anything about that? Brother Larry? <laughs> um, 
Yeah, uh, it, isn't it true that in, in the Greek language, uh, in other places, uh, prominence goes to whoever they list first, if they list, if they list their names? I, I'm missing something there. Say it again. I didn't get your question. Uh, in, in Greek, in the Greek language, when they list names of individuals, whoever they list first, in the Greek, I think it's more important. Is, is that correct? Who they list first, <coughs> usually? I don't really know the answer to that question, so I'm not going to try to answer it. Okay. I'm ignorant about the answer to your question. <laughs> when we talked in, um, well, when we were talking with Denny about um, the role of women in Timothy, he was pointing out in Acts how Priscilla was listed before Aquila. And that... Um, she took a, a part in the teaching of um, Apollos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. She took the leading role. So Larry is saying just Greek language in general, the person listed first has a, a prominent role or is the prominent person for that passage. And I would ask Brother Denny to show me that in some kind of proof. Amen. I'm not saying he's wrong, I just don't know the evidence that he has for that, and I'd have to see it, because I just don't know. <coughs> okay, anybody else have a question? All right, so these are Trinitarian statements, and I want you to know where they are and in what order they come in each of these passages. Dan, is there anywhere the Holy Spirit's mentioned first? Well, <clears throat> the problem with that is, Brother Sean, that these are the only Trinitarian statements I know of. And so I guess the answer to that is, is no. Now, certainly there are discussions where the Spirit of God is, is mentioned in and of Himself, and I don't know that there's any pecking order or any listing so that He would be mentioned first, but uh, as far as these three Trinitarian statements, no. Okay, my brothers, have a good chapel, and I will see you when you get done.